good uh, morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Jake Dubbins. I'm co-founder of the Conscious Advertising Network. Uh, we are a network of 180 brands, agencies, civil society groups, including the United Nations, uh, helping to break the economic uh, link between advertising and the harmful content that we see uh, across the internet uh, and on social media platforms. Um, so we bring together seven different manifestos looking at different areas of harm uh, and how, uh, what is advertisers' role in reducing that harm um, and uh, actually dealing with the human rights abuses that we see uh, across the internet and indeed in uh, the real world as well. So um, I've got an amazing panel here uh, with me. Uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, well, I'd like them to introduce themselves actually. So going to my left, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Victoria Ryan. So, Victoria. Hi guys, um, so I'm Victoria Ryan. So I am uh, the Contents Partnership Director at Initiative, working very closely with LEGO to activate Kids Safe um, part um, partnerships on kind of within media spaces. Hi, Alvin Hussey, Senior Business Development Manager at Super Awesome. Uh, our mission is to build a safer internet for next generation. So we help brands like the LEGO Group um, reach families, Gen Z kids safely across their favorite online platforms and really help them reach them across the kids' media ecosystem, which has become really hyper-fragmented. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Andy Burrows from the Molly Rose Foundation. So we were established following the death of uh, Molly Russell. Um, those of you who um, aren't familiar with her case, uh, Molly was 14 when she died. A coroner ruled that she died uh, from an act of self-harm while experiencing uh, depression and also having experienced the negative effects of uh, social media. Hi, I'm Catherine Russell. I'm Head of Sustainable Business at Vodafone. Um, can't hear me. No, I can't. I can't. I'm sat here and I can't hear you. <laughs> hello. Ooh, hello. Yeah, you can hear. Yeah, yeah. Can yeah, you hear? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. We can hear okay. you. <laughs> Hi, Catherine Russell, Head of Sustainable Business at Vodafone. Um, my role is um, to activate our purpose, which is to connect for a better future. Um, part of that is to um, the work we do in online safety and our digital parenting program. Thanks very much. Um, so we're here to talk about keeping uh, children safe online, but also their rights uh, online <laughs> as well. So like I mentioned, the Conscious Advertising Network has seven different manifestos ranging from sustainability to hate speech to DNI, advertising fraud. And one of our key manifestos is children's rights and well-being. We're just about to relaunch uh, this manifesto next week um, uh, through consultation with 38 different organizations. So we're really here to talk about what that means for advertisers, what's the responsibility of advertisers in the advertising supply chain uh, within this whole ecosystem. So Andy, I want to come to you first. Obviously, the story behind the Molly Rose Foundation is deeply bleak. Um, and I know that since uh, Molly's death, you and Ian Russell and many others have been working uh, on the Online Safety Act, uh, and that is clearly coming into us, well, already now part of, part of law, and Ofcom are, are, are obviously looking at how that gets implemented. I mean, for you, what urgent me measures do you believe are absolutely necessary, both now and in the future, to guarantee children's safety online? Well, I think it's really clear that we've had years of self-regulation of social media companies, of tech companies, and that has failed. So we do now have an Online Safety Act on the statute book. That's a really important step forward, but it is only a step on the journey to where we need to get to, which is that social media platforms are fundamentally safe and they're safe by design. And the gap between where we need to get to and where we are today is quite stark. So we know, for example, that um, last year, just under about 50 uh, young people aged 10 to 19 died by suicide where there was an online element. Uh, and across all of the indicators, I could give you loads of stats that are you know, horrifying uh, like that. But ultimately, what I would say is we are talking here about preventable harm. We are talking about harm that is being manifest by the design choices, the commercial decisions, the commercial imperatives of companies. We need to get to a point where safety is baked in by design, it's not simply an afterthought. Now, you know, in the next few years, we will see legislation be bolstered. As I say, the Online Safety Act is a starting point, but we have much, much further to go. We released research at the end of last year that showed that around half of the content that we 
uh, analysed on Instagram and on TikTok was harmful. That included memes uh, around uh, uh, suicide ideation. It involved uh, algorithmic, uh, just a torrent of depressive content. There's much further to go. And that's why for advertisers in the room, um, you know, there's a real imperative and an ask from us to really use your leverage to start to put pressure on these companies to, to do better at the design stage. Yeah, thanks Andy. I mean, obviously we've talked there about the self-harm suicide content that we're finding on online. A lot of that is monetized by advertisers that they are not aware of and they are inadvertently advertising next to uh, some of this stuff. There is also a kind of, I guess, you might call it a toxification, uh, some might say a tatification of the online spaces for young boys and for young men uh, as well. Um, you know, the, uh, the amount of content out there that is now directly misogynistic against young women and girls is having a huge effect both on young women and girls and also young boys. So I have a 12-year-old son, nine-year-old daughter, always get emotional talking about this stuff, um, but I'd like to, you know, uh, go to you, Catherine, because you've just launched a campaign uh, with Vodafone uh, highlighting this issue, so um, I'd like to show that and then come back to you if that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Oli. Oh, hi, Mari. Oh, she's nice. Thanks, Libs. You're a legend. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, have you ever seen a female do anything properly? Being an alpha comes down to muscle mass and a dominating charm. What? To get a high value woman, you look good. I'm talking working out every never see <laughs> Fail. <laughs> Come on, Ollie. Women shouldn't even be allowed to drive. Forget it, mate. That Miss Webb shouldn't be making life hard. She should be in the kitchen. <laughs> Desperate. Ollie, did you really write this? Call this exercise, you want to get shredded, you need to put more, more. on, oh, a girl can do better than this, oh my god, Ollie. tick, come, Ollie. go away you worthless freak, hi Ollie, hi Maddy, fail, come on Ollie, did you really write this? <laughs> no, no, desperate. So that's pretty powerful stuff, um, and demanding a safer internet is exactly what we're talking about here. I know that you know, it's almost a leading question, but what was behind you know, Vodafone getting involved and launching? What prompted specifically that campaign? Um, so we've been working in online safety through a digital parenting program for many years, for coming up 15 years. Um, and I suppose the thing that has led to this was the groundswell of in, the, the conversation has been around kids being online on any device but within the last eight, 12 18 months it's moved more towards smartphones and young people being on smartphones and that brings Vodafone much more into the conversation and you know, in my opinion that means we need to be, be responsible and raise awareness of this type of thing that is happening that parents and teachers don't know is happening but that affects everyone. So in the, some of the research we did to um, launch this film was showing that 
70% of teachers were, were hearing misogynistic language in the classroom. So it's affecting girls as well as boys, um, everybody who is trying to learn. Um, and the boys, you know, they're not to blame. They're going online and looking for fitness content or nutrition content or entrepreneurship. And then they're being fed by algorithm more and more and more of this, this harmful, misogynistic, hateful um, stuff. And, and, it's, and it's, it goes in subliminally, so it has this impact. I mean, it, it really does. And that content is prioritized by the algorithms, right? You know, that's, that's the critical point, you know. We often talk in this space about freedom of speech, and there's also, you know, there's a there's a question around freedom of expression, but there is no right to algor for algorithmic promotion by X for Andrew Tate, right? That is not a human right, I guess. Um, Victoria, I wanted to come to you, and, and obviously the work that you've done over the years with with Lego. Um, how do you approach this with Lego? You know, what are the what is the criteria that you use to select? You know, obviously Lego is a hugely iconic global brand you know what's the criteria that you use because to, to select media partners what platforms you may or may not go on you know it'd be really interesting to hear lego's approach yeah i mean and and i think you know is <clears throat> is obviously a really important point that you know when you are a brand such as lego when you're a brand such as vodafone a well-known well-loved brand you have a responsibility to stand up for some of these challenges right yep. uh, we have the voice to do it we have kind of influence with parents and we have influence with children so we have the responsibility alongside the reputation um, lego has very stringent policies in place in terms of the types of um, media companies that we can work with obviously we've got alvin here from super awesome so they one, that's one of them um, we need to work with copper compliant and gdprk compliant publishers um, which essentially means that the rights of children and their data is protected and not collected um, in terms of the kind of platforms that we go on, uh, we are very thoughtful about those platforms. So, you know, kind of kids, um, the kids safe media gaming apps um, for kind of some of the partnerships that we activate in. Uh, we make sure that you're talking about appropriate um, areas. So, you know, the likes of Talking Tom and things like that. Um, and I think what's really important is when we think about some of the bigger platforms, especially the social platforms, we do not use those when we advertise, advertise when we market to children. Yeah. Um, and I think it's very important that brands such as ourselves and other big brands, you need to vote with your feet. These companies will not start taking this seriously unless they lose the money from large advertisers such as ourselves and it forces them to. And, you know, it's not enough to say that, you know, parents should be educating their children. These companies are responsible, as you say, for putting in place algorithms that feed um, some of the kind of negative and nefarious content to individuals. They have enough data to know who these individuals are, and it should stop when it's with children. For, for, well, and with adults as well, but particularly with children. I really admire that kind of, you know, the consciousness, the, the choices, the thought, you said the thoughtfulness that you put into the partnerships that, that, that Lego builds. I think that one of the issues with this entire advertising supply chain is just the total lack of transparency across the entire ecosystem. So in the US, the ANA did a study earlier on this year on, on the programmatic supply chain, and it found that the average campaign was on 44,000 websites, right? We've got a member of the content advertising network called Halion who make Sensodyne and Volterol and that kind of stuff. They found themselves on 184,000 websites globally. Yeah. That is not thoughtful. That is not carefully curating an advertising experience. That is over-reliance on a, on a tech platform and tech platforms that are swallowing up the cash and spraying and praying across the internet. So. I know Super Awesome do not take that approach, That's correct, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> making the uh, uh, internet safer for children. You know, Alvin, what's, how do you balance sort of the pressure from brands mm -hmm. to go, you know, we need reach, we need frequency, we need engagement, mm -hmm. and that sort of absolute you know, mandate for, for, for brand safety that, that you guys approach? Yeah, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive in any way, shape, or form. You know, I think... We, I mean, we, we help our clients understand where kids are, where families are, and how to reach them safely, compliantly, uh, in age-appropriate manners. So, in actual fact, there's lots of ways of engagement and driving reach and awareness and frequency. 
Um, it's all about working with the right partners who are doing that correctly. So, and also how you measure engagement. You know, I think there's different ways of measuring engagement without having to collect personal private data. You know, we, we've done campaigns with, um, sorry, competitive Lego Hasbro. You know, we recently relaunched Furby. Does anyone remember Furby, by the way? Oh, yes. I love them. I, always, I really wanted the, uh, <laughs> who's the character in Gremlins? The little one, Gizmo. Gizmo. Oh my God, I wanted the Gizmo one. My parents, uh, um, and th we relaunched Furby for the next generation of kids by doing an integration in Roblox called Club Roblox. We worked with a vetted partner and we were able to get amazing results. I think it was visited, you know, 36 million visits, 3.6 million kids actually chose to have a little Furby BFF that would follow them around. And we're still able to measure lots of ways while still being safe and compliant. So I actually don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I actually think there's ways of doing so, um, but you need to do it in the right way. And that's what we do at Super awesome. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. And, and, and again, there's that thoughtfulness, that, yep. that criteria. I think one of the things that we try and encourage across the Conscious Advertising Network is ask better questions of your Definitely. partners. Yep. Like, you know, I, I do think there was said in another other talk recently about brands taking back control. <laughs> Yes. Interesting phrase to use on election day, right? But, uh, you know, um, but brands actually taking responsibility for their supply chain yes. and asking better questions. If you're on 184,000 websites, well, you should be asking better questions of, of where your ads are showing up. I also wanted to touch on you know, the question of, you know, because the manifesto is on uh, both child rights as well as well-being. And clearly there is a, you know, what is the rights of the child as well within the, uh, uh, the digital, um, I guess, world that we now live. Um, I'll try not to get emotional again, but like I said, I've got a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old. Uh, they don't have a smartphone, so uh, we've chosen to keep that, you know, away for, for, for now and probably will do for quite far in advance because of exactly that video that's just been, just been shared. Um, but... You know, there is a question of what is the child's rights to information online as well. So there's talk in government, maybe a change in government, about whether or not smartphones should be banned. So I'd really like, you know, this is a very difficult question as, as to the rights of the child and the agency of the child. So maybe, you know, if we start with you, Catherine, how do you, how do you see that? Um, so we've done a lot of research in this area, obviously. Um, and by the way, my children, who are now 17 and 19, they had a feature phone first. So, and they hated me because I worked for Vodafone and <laughs> thought they should have a smartphone. So um, I'm, a, I'm a believer in every family is different. Every family and parents and carers want to do the, the, th the thing that they think is suitable for their child. Also, what is suitable for child two and three might not be the same as what is suitable for Absolutely. child one. Yeah. But um, what the position we take at Vodafone is that we should provide the tools and resources for open conversations within families so that, that safety is there, so, uh, so that, that children know where to go if things go wrong, so that parents know how to um, support their children when things go wrong, so that they know how to set things up properly, so that if they decide, well, you know, there's a lot of young children on tablets, for example, before yep. they're on smartphones, or gaming devices, there are safety settings and parental controls on all of those things. So for us, it was about providing a helpful resource for Absolutely. parents and carers to use when setting all of these things up, which is what we've got. Um, as far as, you know, smartphone-free childhood debate that is going on at the moment, you know, there's a, there's a groundswell of parents that support that. And, you know, that is absolutely their, their right and position. Um, there's also a debate around should there be smartphones in schools? Um, or should they be taken away while kids are at school? Well, a lot of children have their homework on smartphones. Absolutely. You know, and, and there's also a bit of a discrepancy between what parents think and what children think. Yeah. So young children, young people, in our research, say, we want to be at, have access to this stuff because otherwise we won't have the digital skills we need to get a job. And we're already worried about what the future looks like for us. So I, th I think it's, it's, it's a fine line and it's got to be family specific. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, know, you provide the, the support, provide the tools, resources, and let the families make the decision for themselves. And it's, it's really interesting you say yeah. that because we, we market to children. And I think what's really interesting is the six and eight-year-olds of 10 years ago are not the six and eight-year-olds of today. 
Um, I think it's, I find it terrifying. I've got a new little nephew and he's already kind of like, he, any screen that he sees, he's already knows to kind of swipe it kind of thing. And I think, you know, this is the world that our children are growing up in. Now, taking things away does not work. The reality is, you know, in the world that we are, um, that we are in and in the world that these children are growing up into, certain skill sets, particularly around technology, are going to be required. Um, but you're absolutely right, it's about education um, as kind of a key part of that. And, you know, at LEGO we do a lot of education in terms of kind of safer internet. Um, we have kind of huge kind of um, digital kind of education pieces, as we should, as a brand who has influence on parents and children. Um, but it is just interesting because I think, you know, it's terrifying. Children don't differentiate between screens now. You know, watching the television is, is kind of a, a, a kind of uh, a thing of the past to a certain extent. Um, I don't think that you can necessarily kind of like take that back. You know, once I think, um, Alvin, you, you said oh, this the I, other day. Oh, my colleague, I can't take any credit for this whatsoever. She said you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Which is wonderful and so very, very true. Um, but I think, you know, it's terrifying. You know, there is content online and, and our children are, are not capable of identifying that it is a deep fake, right? Mm. So everything that is going out to children is considered to be real. And I think that's kind of one of the kind of biggest challenges that we need to, we need to kind of help parents understand and help yeah. teachers educate towards. I think that picking up on that, the, the, I guess the asymmetry of the power imbalance between the big multi-billion dollar, trillion dollar tech platforms and the individual parent trying to make sense of, you know, that information environment. Um, there was a, uh, you talk about deep fake, there was a, um, an AI generated porn image of Taylor Swift that was seen by 47 million people on X before that was taken down. You know, if kids are seeing that, do they know that's real? Do they not know that's real? They're seeing it, right? 47 million people saw it, you know, so. And Andy, I'd really like to come to you with, you know, because obviously, you know, had Molly not had access to those sorts of platforms, I guess the, the asymmetry is what we're battling here, isn't it? The kind of power of the algorithm, the scale and money of that versus the individual parent at home struggling to deal with how they are going to navigate their kids through this. Yeah, and there is, there is that really pronounced asymmetry because, you know, right now the onus has been on parents to help to make sure that their children are safe when using mm. these products and, and actually, you know, on children to somehow be resilient uh, to risks when they're using products that very often are not safe by design. And I think you could arguably say are dangerous by design. Mm. And so we mm. do need to address that asymmetry. But on the point around bans, you know, I think it would be really understandable for families who have lost children uh, because of the failures of social media to think that we should pull up the drawbridge and restrict access. Um, but I have to say, across most of the bereaved families that I have the honour and the privilege of, of working with, that isn't actually, you know, kind of what they think. And, you know, it's, it's quite striking in some respects, you know, when uh, um, the Russells now are a family of four, they're not a family of five, there's a space at the table. But, you know, kind of, I I Ian, Molly's father, would say very strongly that, you know, it's really important that we understand both the immense harm that can come from big tech companies not being regulated, not having to make sure that their products are fundamentally safe for children. But at the same time, we can't lose track of the fact that we know that technology can be fantastic. It can yeah. be hugely positive for children. And, you know, the calls, though, they're completely understandable to restrict access to introduce bans for social media you know we pull up the drawbridge and that means a whole set of unintended consequences if you are a child who is lonely or vulnerable or experiencing poor mental health if you are a child growing up to discover your gender or sexual identity you yeah. know social media can be fantastic it can be a lifeline so there is a responsibility that we get this right and that means that the tech companies design their products safely not that we simply restrict access but I think a word of caution you know the groundswell for much more to be done is is palpable we can see this being expressed by parents right across the country now I completely understand with I, I completely understand even if I don't agree with those calls for a ban I think 
the message that I would that I would say to everyone working in this space who has leverage is that you know the argument is a pretty nuanced one that actually we've got to make these products safe rather than just restricting access that feels like the kind of easy straightforward thing to do if we don't see more progress i think we could lose that argument and that would be bad for children and it would be bad for you know kind of ev ev you know it would be bad for everyone here it would be bad for society so we've got to see more action being done to drive safety because otherwise we end up with consequences that actually are bad for children and probably bad for us all yep. yeah it's like um, what ian i was gonna say i mean ian ian did a really good article in the guardian i think back in april and his answer to the smartphone ban was and the social media ban is that actually you're punishing kids for the fact that their tech companies are fa failing to do safety by design. It's really, it's, just, it's arguably as simple as that. These tech companies need to be safe. The other thing to bear in mind, I'm conscious about our conversation, the internet is more than just social media. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to think about, you mentioned, you know, Talking Tom, Alfred 7, the mobile apps, you talk about Roblox, talk about Fortnite. The internet is bigger than just social media. And I feel like any tech giant, any internet giant, Pretty much anyone involved in this should be acting in a way to make sure that children's well-being should be number one priority. And if, and it's, if the internet is safe for kids, then it should be a big step to make it safe for all of us. And I think all of us in the room here, advertisers, brands, all have a big part to, uh, to play in that. Talking of that, Alvin, um, we're just going to go through a bit of a deep dive, well, not too deep a dive, we're not going to rattle through millions of slides, but, you know, like I said, we, are going, we, we have been relaunching our Children's Wellbeing Manifesto with the partnership of some of the people uh, on, this, uh, on this platform. So I just wanted to talk about then the responsibilities of advertisers and, I guess, advertisers underestimating their power in this space. So we're relaunching this, uh, this manifesto, Children's Rights and Wellbeing. Um, it has new content and advice that reflects global actionable advice. There's case studies and toolkits uh, to make implementation easier. And just to be very clear, Conscious Advertising Network is a non-profit volunteer uh, organization where you uh, can join but there is no fees, okay? So as, as advertisers, that's a really important thing. The consultation uh, led by Yo Zhang, who's in our audience uh, today and the amazing uh, Conscious Advertising Network team, has had 52 respondents across advertising and civil society. So big global agencies, Omnicom Media Group, Dentsu, who have just done a human rights impact uh, assessment across uh, globally, Group M, Impress, the UN, like we said, and then the ICO, SIF, Molly Rose Foundation as well, so, and, and Super Awesome. So there's many, many organizations that have worked across uh, this issue to take a look at what are the different impacts, unintended consequences, and so on uh, of this issue. So just as guiding <coughs> principles, um, the panel's talked a lot about this principle of safety by design. None of the tech platforms, by the way, were set up with safety by design. That is not how they were, uh, they were set up and how they were monetized, and is not how they're monetized now. We recently launched with the UN the Global uh, Principles for Information Integrity, and in the press, uh, uh, press conference with Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, the lead comms uh, uh, um, there, Melissa Fleming, talked about how Meta downranks UN content. So that safety by design is not baked into the system. You know, they, the algorithms are promoting the content that drives the biggest reach in order that therefore they can sell more inventory, more advertising to, uh, to advertisers. So that safety by design principle yeah. is absolutely critical to get right from a regulation point of view. Um, Obviously, the responsible practice point is, you know, there are now legal frameworks coming across this issue. So the Online Safety Act here, the DSA, uh, but also we're asking organizations to do a child rights impact assessment as well. Okay. It's exactly what's happened with Dentsu's recent work on human rights. So they're looking at what are the human rights impacts, but also what, what's the impact uh, on children. Um, age appropriate, developing and placing advertising that is age appropriate by design. This doesn't just hit online. This isn't just having your ads next to content, for example, that you do not want next to uh, a 14-year-old looking at it. It is also starting to confront offline behaviors as well. I cannot tell you how furious I get watching the Euros and having betting ad after betting ad after betting ad with my 9-year-old and 12-year-old. We have to consider where our ads are showing up. Um, the fourth point is about agency, so supporting child users' decision-making. 
And that is, again, about transparency. You know, there's been better transparency around influencers uh, more recently. I sat through uh, a presentation yesterday about AI and the rise of AI influencers. Mm -hmm. There is no regulation about labeling or watermarking uh, content from AI um, in the advertising industry and the rise of AI influencers. I think disclosure is so important. Yeah, you're right, because yeah, we... Absolutely. We're part of um, KBU, the Children Advertiser Responsibility Unit. We're part of the AI working group, and a big part of that is disclosure to yes. make sure that in, in advertising, so when a kid sees an advert, they know if it's AI generated or not. For example, the Toys of Us ad. So if anyone's seen that, whatever your opinion is, that should be disclosed as AI generated. Absolutely. I mean, that's just the basic premise. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you think as an advertiser for, for that point of view, like making AI? You know, one of your competitors, they were making the bubble, you know, uh, from AI. But literally, there's no regulation about labelling what is and what isn't made by AI. Yeah, I think there absolutely should be. Yeah. There absolutely should be. My daughter showed me the other day an, an, an AI influencer on Instagram. And she said, I can't, she's 19, I can't tell that this is AI. And, and if she can't tell, mm. I definitely can't tell. I'm, so I'm so. laughing because there's an AI beauty pageant. and everyone seen it? It's, it's hilarious. I, I sent it to one of my friends who competed in beauty pageants. And she was like, cool, okay, this is where the world is. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's, there are benefits to AI. You know, we, yeah. I mean, we're using it in terms of how we can optimize and minimize wastage and all that sort of thing. But there does need to be a considered approach to how AI, especially in the kids' space, you know, make sure there's guardrails in place yep. to ensure that, um, that it's age-appropriate and safe. And, 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 and kids are already aware of AI, by the way, at a very young age. They're very aware of it from even as young as, say, preschool, you know, they see it as like a robot, but it's, it's becoming a key part. Like the internet has been a part of our lives now. There will be a point where kids will say to you, wow, you grew up where there was no AI. <laughs> That's crazy. So I think we need to be prepared for that. Yep. So yeah, the last couple on here are privacy, and we've talked about privacy by design, and you know, there is no need to be collecting data from uh, children uh, for marketing and development uh, distribution. Yep. And last point is on DEI. Uh, and making sure that being inclusive, and that is both in terms of accessibility, you know, thinking about, you know, kids who are visually and audio impaired, for example, yep. but also making sure that we are representing within our advertising, you know, uh, no stereotypes, you know, positive role models uh, within uh, that DEI space as well. So, five things that you can take away from this. There's a QR code at the end, so you don't have to scribble all of this down, but questions to ask yourselves. Are you mindful of children possibly seeing your adverts? If so, what are you doing? Do you avoid using pla pl platforms you, uh, lacking age verification? This is a really important one, I think, because the disconnect sometimes between a chief sustainability officer, a human rights ethicist within big business, and the brand team and the media team, that sometimes is a chasm. Yeah. So making sure your values and your approach to brand safety are matched across your business and your media agency. Are you aware of, your ch of a particular country's regulations on children's exposure to your ad materials and also following your country's regulations on collecting data uh, and on, ch uh, on children? And then also, I would say, this is for later, but later meaning tomorrow, uh, checking influence, influencers' reputation and audience. I talked about Andrew Tate earlier, for example. He's still a blue tick influencer on X, okay? We have no idea there's no transparency as to the revenue shares of creators across the social media platform. So it could be entirely possible that advertisers are directly funding exactly the creators that we are talking about in this creators. Should I call them creators? Misogynistic twats um, <laughs> that, that are uh, earning money from this stuff. Um, again, that representation of diverse perspectives and cultures in the content. Uh, so that's really important. Disabling data collection for those under 18. Inclusion lists. Inclusion lists are absolutely vital. The block listing of the, um, uh, the verification organizations aren't good enough. They actually block it, the list on, uh, on actual words, which means that entire sections of the internet end up being demonetized, which yeah. is, again, we don't want. Uh, and then avoiding detailed pro, uh, profiles uh, for children. Yeah. I'm going to put up um, the... QR code for you to take a look at uh, as well. But yeah, I just wanted a bit of, we've got only got sort of seven minutes left. So I wanted a bit of reflection on some of that, that stuff that obviously a lot of us work together on. Um, and I guess for the audience, what are the key takeaways, you know, from, a, from an advertiser point of view, 
uh, obviously from a charity point of view, a platform, uh, and again, you know, an agency representing a big advertiser. So again, I might start this end this yeah. time. So <clears throat> I think for me, you know, let's just be better. I think it's as simple as that. You know, if you have friends or whatever that have children, think about, you know, how you would potentially affect that children with the advertising that you're placing. I think it's incredibly important. I think the tech companies need to stand up and take some responsibility. And I think we need to vote with our feet. If there are platforms there that are, um, you know, practicing nefariously when it talks about when, when it comes to children or adults, indeed, um, you need to vote with your feet. So that would be my takeaway. Yeah, I mean, I would also say be concerned, not scared, if that makes sense. So there are, there are tools and companies out there who can help with this element. You know, there's, there's really great opportunities to engage the younger generation, to make campaigns that are fun, impactful, exciting. Um, and you just need to make sure that you are following the, the, the QR code <laughs> checklist and make sure you're doing things in the correct way. And it doesn't have to be super complicated. I mean, we actually run training called Kid Aware, which is completely free, where we go through very, the Very, very good. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Happy customer. Uh, but you do the, it, all, it goes through the do's and don'ts of how to engage say, you know, audiences online safely. So I would say, don't be scared, like we talked about. Don't be scared to ask questions of your agency and your partners. You, know, you should be able to ask them and say, okay, how do I know my ad is being seen or how do I know it's on a safe place? How, can you t how do you do that? Um, we talked about AI. A lot of companies have AI tools. I would always say there needs to be a human element. You need to have human moderation involved. You, you can't just rely on AI platforms. So um, that would be my main takeaway. Do you know, there's, there's a risk that some of the problems that we're talking about when we're, when we're thinking about kind of harmful content that's being pushed out by algorithms, there's actually a risk that, the, that this situation is getting worse, not better. Um, thinking about AI, for example, um, we'll be sharing some research in the next few weeks. 1% of uh, uh, posts showing suicide and self-harm content are already AI-generated. We can see a tsunami coming. This problem is going to get worse because uh, you know, tech platforms are not doing enough. In that context, you have leverage in this room, and I really encourage you to use it. Uh, speak to your agencies, speak to the companies themselves if you have those relationships. Ask those questions, because you, know, you, you have a huge amount of power there in terms of your ad spends. You can really help us to make meaningful change here. Really good point. Um, um, I mean, my takeaway would be, I think the principles are, fa are fabulous. Um, and I think they're aspirational for a brand like mine. Um, and I will be taking them back and showing them to my brand director. Absolutely, definitely. But I also think the solution here is collective. It is that everybody needs to take action. You know, online safety is in the Labour Party manifesto. If they get in today, then there might be change coming and it will be, uh, you know, it will be more, there will be more focus than there has been. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a topic that's not going to go away, but it means that collectively, private sector, public sector, NGO, we all need to work together to, to you know, call for change and do our part. Thanks very much. Um, I'd just like to leave, I guess, the last word to Andy. Uh, I know that um, Ian Russell was in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago with our team and others, uh, the Centre for Countering Digital Hate. This is... You know, this isn't just a local UK problem, uh, this is a global problem. How do you see, uh, I guess, the international community coming together to better put pressure on the tech platforms who often are based in, on the west coast of America or indeed in, uh, in parts of China? Well, I mean, you're right. This is, a, this is an international problem. The, you know, the debate, the degree of concern is... Is, is increasingly being palpably uh, felt. And, um, you know, ultimately it will be in the US where we can see a lot of the impact uh, being generated. We're seeing, you know, kind of more progress towards legislation and there's actually a chance of getting legislation through on Capitol Hill around online safety. Uh, but it is really vital that the tech companies based out of California understand that child safety and well-being is not simply a nice to have yeah, that harm so. isn't just an externality that then families and societies around the world can pick up and deal with uh, that they have to build this into their services and how they run their products and again that's my ask of all of you 
that you can go away and start that conversation, ask those, com you know, ask those difficult questions, apply that pressure, because that's how we can really change the mindset and the commercial focus of these companies. Thanks, Andy. Um, certainly from the Conscious Ad Network's point of view, I think, like we said, the brands underestimate their power. You said it really, really well, where brands and civil society and governments coming together on this issue is part of the way that we're going to solve this. We've sat in many meetings with some of the tech platforms, and I tell you what, they do not like the money being in the room. They do not like big brands putting pressure on them to change their policies and enforce their policies better. So joining forces with brands and civil society is definitely where it is at. I, uh, I also would like to encourage everybody, and I know I got a little bit emotional earlier, but to take this personally, you know, these, these are our communities, these are our families, these are our own children, right? You know, uh, this, this, there is a massive asymmetry here where multi-trillion dollar companies control what we see, what we do, what we experience online. So I would ask everybody to take this personally. And then finally, obviously, have a look at what we're doing at the Conscious Advertising Network. Like I said, free to join. If you don't join, you can still nick the stuff and use it and take it. Um, we're encouraging everybody to get involved in this because, like I said, working together, we can actually make a better impact. I'd like to thank uh, all of you for being so amazing on this panel. Uh, and, uh, yeah, thanks to Madfest. And thanks to Yo Jung and the team who have been putting together this wonderful uh, piece of work. Thank you. thank you so much, Jake, Victoria, Alvin, Andy, and Catherine. That was so amazing.